neurosurgery is being revolutionized by um, smaller cameras and what are called endoscopes. In general surgery, years ago, I remember when I was a medical student, there was a lot of controversy as to whether or not things could be performed with a laparoscope, which is an endoscope that goes into the belly. Now, almost all procedures are performed that way. Similarly, in uh, the neurosurgical world, there is a slower adaptation, but it's becoming more prominent, especially in pituitary surgery. Hello, my name is Jamie Van Gumpel. I am a professor in neurosurgery and otolaryngology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And I'd like to uh, discuss with you the findings of our research that we are publishing in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings in the August of 2021 episode. Uh, my co-authors in this article are Dr. John Atkinson, Dr. Garrett Choby, Dr. Casper Bauer, Janalee Stoken, Dr. Janice, Dr. O'Brien, Dr. Jason Little, Dr. Irina Boncos, Dr. Carolyn Davidge Pitts, Dr. Justine Herndon, Dr. Dana Erickson, uh, Dr. Lanier as well. So if we look at national trends, as of 10 years ago, very few people were using endoscope to, uh, to approach these particular tumors. And nowadays it's, it's become the majority of surgeons that do these operations use an endoscope to remove these tumors. But it's difficult to know why that change has occurred because to the surgeons doing these procedures, um, what impact has it has, has it had, has it improved care, and why are we doing this? So this paper in, in specific addresses that point at a practice that does an awful lot of pituitary tumors and has surgeons that are uh, not just one surgeon performing all the procedures. So if you look in the literature, um, there is a study out there called the transfer study who is looking at primarily centers that do microscopic surgery and primarily centers that do endoscopic surgery and comparing them head to head because those two surgeons do it the best way, but they're doing all the pituitaries at their centers. Um, and, uh, and there's other papers out there where people transition from microscope to endoscope looking at their practices, but very few intra-institutional studies that shows how this is in a contemporary practice. And that's the point of this paper. Um, if you refer in our article to, to uh, figure one, this really helps understand the difference of why, uh, the difference between the procedures. So the microscope itself is a tried and true method that's been used ever since Gio in, in the 1960s, where the, end, the ENT surgeon does an approach to the pituitary area, which is called the sphenoid sinus and the cella. And a microscope was brought in and that has light that's outside the field that's projected through a tube that's placed into the nose down to the cella. And the issue has always been with this is that we're limited in our view uh, into where that, that limited area of um, uh, vision is. And we have to operate through the same way we see. That's figure panels one, two, and three within figure one. In figure one, A, B, and C demonstrates a larger field of view, a more detailed field, field of view um, that we see with these modern cameras. And this is a 4K camera that demonstrated this. And what you'll notice in this is that the instrumentation is very similar between the two. So on the far right, there's a little um, a curette that you can see the difference between the two and how they look within each field. But there is some substantial differences that are that probably account for why people are transitioning to one. And maybe we haven't realized all the differences between the two. But truthfully, the philosophies between the two surgeries are very different as well. And that's the real impact of this paper is that the microscopic philosophy is to make a smaller opening in the center and bringing the tumor into that area. Whereas the endoscopic philosophy is to expose a lot more of the tumor, see it and visually remove it, trying to ensure that we have a better resection. Um, and this paper details experience over the course of January 1, 2014 to December 31st, 2019. And we collected one year outcomes in these paper or these patients and treating 534 patients uh, uh, during that time. When we looked at our practice, um, uh, nearly one fifth of the patients had undergone prior surgery at another institution. And, uh, and our center is a, a, a center of referral. Um, and uh, so there's a higher percentage than most series would have of reoperations, and that probably impacts some of the, the data that we found. 
But the most important take home messages of this particular paper are inexperienced hands at experienced centers. Um, the overall outcome of pituitary surgery is quite excellent. So we see it's very uncommon that there's a pituitary uh, a post-operative infection or meningitis. In our series, the overall percentage was 0.4%. And um, no infections occurred in the endoscopic group, but there were two uh, infections accounting for a 0.8% within the microscopic group. There, were, uh, there was only one death in 534 patients uh, that occurred um, um, secondary to uh, a small bleed, and that occurred in the microscopic group in this particular series. And then more importantly, patients did very well with very few secondary treatments and their pituitary tumor was taken care of commonly with one operation. Um, the other really critical take home points are the discussion out there amongst academicians that perform these procedures is the endoscope allows a larger percentage of resection. Well, we looked at that in tumors that were larger and we saw, so tumors over 2.5 centimeters where, we, where it's been reported to make an impact. We did realize, um, and that's what Dr. Little spent a lot of time looking at with volumetric resection, is that we saw mm -hmm. about a five to 6% increased uh, percentage of resection with, those, with patients undergoing endoscopic procedures. Nonetheless, our group has previously published that we need commonly over 85% resection to avoid a secondary therapy. In the microscopic and endoscopic groups, both had a substantial resection over 85%. So the question is whether or not this is uh, significant. Uh, it is significant by numbers, but we don't know if that ultimately results in less treatments. When we looked at our patients, there was roughly a two to one uh, number of secondary treatments, most commonly radiation. So receiving radiation for progressive or residual tumor after your surgery within the microscopic group compared to the endoscopic group. We feel this may be a surrogate for leaving more tumor behind, however, are, are unsure. But there was an increased number of patients that had another treatment because of uh, or after a microscopic surgery. It is very common for pituitary patients to stay in prolonged period of time in the hospital uh, at most reported series, so commonly out to three days. In our study, the average length of stay between both endoscopic and microscopic was 1.3 days, and 82% of patients left the hospital by post-op day one. And you would naturally say, well, this would must lead to people being readmitted twice as commonly. What we actually have reported is that we have readmissions within the first 30 days, half as much as what was seen in, in other national large study studies. When we looked at our practice, probably the most critical uh, or most um, uh, important findings were the real true value of still developed multidisciplinary groups, um, which most critically involve our endocrine colleagues that give a substantial outpatient support to patients so they're not bouncing back to the hospital or, or, or uh, back into ERs receiving additional care. And that, that cr a care occurs uh, usually with follow-up lab testing, which is typically mail-in and phone contact by that group, which demonstrates a substantial um, cost savings to the patients. The other, um, I think, critical aspects to focus on with this is that in this practice, less than 2% of patients um, ultimately develop CSF leaks postoperatively, which is a common concern to patients. And what we also see in all comers, it's different amongst different groups, however, is that 8% of patients after a pituitary tumor resection develop a new hormonal de defect, most commonly uh, a reduction in their postoperative thyroid hormone. Overall, the paper's main take-home points are that with large multidisciplinary groups engaged in pituitary practice, safe care can be delivered over time, which benefits the patient substantially, both in long-term cure and a reduction in the number of treatments and low numbers of complications. I would love it if you took the time to take a look at our article. There's further details within that. So please refer to the August 2021 Mayo Clinic Proceedings and please enjoy our article. Thank you. We hope you found this presentation from the content of our website valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients 
by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you'll find access to information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about Healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.